Hi, afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Today we have been joined by David McLean, and David and I are going to talk about the fear of the unknown. And let's face it, this is something that's really, really important right now because um, with so much uncertainty, I don't know about everybody else, but that's my biggest, um, my biggest anxiety at the moment is the fear of the unknown. We don't really know, and nobody really knows where and what we are going to do about COVID-19. And the effect that it's having on our lives and our businesses is massive. So I really love this topic. Um, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about David and why I've always been impressed with him and why I find him an interesting person to talk to us at the moment as well. So I'm reading a few notes just because I don't forget. And David is an ex Royal Marine. Um, and of course that means mental and physical toughness. Um, but he's trained in human, he's a, a trained human behavioral specialist. And so since leaving the military, which he did about eight years ago, if I'm not mistaken, he has really followed, followed his passion. And his passion is really um, helping his clients with well-being and mental um, wellness. Um, he is the CEO of a very large therapeutic organization and also runs a business called DRM. And he works with a range of businesses and a range of clients, helping them with their mental health and well-being. Is that a fair assessment of you, David? Yes, thank you very much. That's not bad at all. Yes, I appreciate that. Great. So today we're going to walk through and try to understand this. You've been talking about the fear of response and what it does to our bodies. You're going to talk about what we can really do about it because, I mean, it's all well and good knowing about it. But, I mean, how do, what do we do to, to manage and I suppose to just control and manage it in some form and not because I always hate that word control because it always makes us feel like a failure if we're not controlling it. But what do we know about it? And then how do we manage it? Um, and so that's a little bit about me and uh, or about me introducing David. And it's time for me to hand over to David. So maybe, David, you can do a little bit of an introduction as well. Sure. Sure. Yeah, thank you. No, I appreciate your time as well today. Um, so and thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, fear, I, I completely agree with what you're saying there, that fear, um, we're not trying, we are trying to control it and we're not trying to control it. It's a very natural, I'll talk more about this uh, in terms of what the fear response is, but it's a very natural and normal thing that happens. Um, and it's, it's a good job that we have a fear response because it's made sure that as a, as a species, we've survived. If we didn't have it, didn't have it then we'd all be eaten by saber-toothed tigers or whatever um, hundreds of thousands of years ago, so we wouldn't actually be here. So actually, it's a very, very important thing. But of course, in terms of today, in terms of, of, of increased fear, increased anxiety and, and, and uh, feelings of uh, being afraid or whatever these may well yeah. be that are linked to fear, it's all the same sort of thing. And of course, we want to be able to monitor that and reduce it. And that's the kind of the key point, really. And, and of course, with everybody that's well aware of COVID-19, the pandemic that's going on at the moment, um, most people's, generally people's levels of fear um, have been raised. Uh, so that leads to higher anxiety, higher stress, less uh, or worse decision making, sorry. Um, yeah. So it's, it's good if we can recognize what's going on in terms of fear. And it's good if we can recognize and, and, and perhaps learn a little bit more about it, learn exactly what it is, because not everybody knows that. Um, and then, of course, importantly, what we can do about it so that we can reduce it so that we can be more productive, so that we can we can cope better with life, whatever's going on. Um, uh, we can cope with the, I think some people are in different places, aren't they? Me, personally, I think yourself, we're self-isolating or we're on our own, which brings yeah. its own challenges. But however, I feel for the people who are stuck in, uh, in a one two bedroom flat with two children and you know etc yeah, yeah. and they're, they're, they're stuck in there with no public space or, or nowhere to go out no garden things like that so so we've all got our own challenges as well so by reducing the fear response in general we can we can increase so much more of our life and that's what i want to sort of basically talk about today and that's that's really good yeah because i find that sometimes that's the problem is making decisions you you somehow have a lot of time right now but yet it feels like I don't know. It's a funny thing. I, I, I feel less able to make decisions and I'm not sure it's because, and that's, I would imagine you're going to cover that, but it's that funny thing. I've spoken to so many people that have said to me, you know, I, I feel like I've got all the time, but I don't want to do anything. <laughs> I find that really interesting. And I think that's part of this anxiety that we, we suffer from. And um, I remember when I gave up smoking, you know, an addiction is a funny thing. And, um, but I remember that 
I, the biggest help for me was recognizing the signs in myself and then able to say, okay, I want a cigarette. And then I was able to actually logically walk my way through that. So I'm very interested in what you're saying because I love a tool. I love someone to say to me, Helen, if you do this and do this, it will help. Then if I can recognize those signs, then I can say to myself, okay, remember David said, do this. So I'm very interested in what you've got to say. So how does this really relate to to COVID-19, this fear of response at the moment? Is it just because we don't know and there's so many external factors in it that we feel out of control? No, absolutely. I mean, the fear of the unknown is one of the key aspects of human nature of, that, that we live with. <clears throat> and we all deal with it, <clears throat> excuse me, fear of, of getting things wrong. You know, there's all sorts of different levels of fear that we can have. Um, uh, but when we have autonomy in our own life, when we know we're getting paid um, each month, when, when we know that the supermarkets have got the food that we're supposed to have in, in our normal, very common uh, days be before this, generally speaking, then we have a certain kind of ease within our life. Um, but of course, when we have something like this pandemic, when we, you know, and you know that, that the, you've heard it, and we've all have heard it, all the listeners or viewers, were, you know, the toilet paper, and everybody's talking up in toilet paper, <laughs> toothpaste, and all these things, which is completely unnecessary. Um, but that kind of raise the COVID nineteen has just given us that that extra bit, if you like, in terms um, of, of the fear response. And what does that do? It stops us thinking clearly, as you say. It, it, it stops you focusing on what you do want to do and, and how you want to do things. And it's the basis of it is, that, again, most people will understand or, or have heard of the fight flight response. Yes. That when your metaphorical stress, when your stress bucket, if you can imagine this is the bucket, when it raises up and up and up, what happens, unfortunately, is you move from the calm, relaxed, easygoing, in control part of the brain that sits in the top, the prefrontal cortex, and sits across the top of the brain. When you're calm, relaxed, easygoing, motivated, productive, and it moves you down into the lower regions of the brain when your stress bucket fills up, and of course, okay. the stressful situation is going on at the moment. And when you move down into that area of the brain, then it's not there for making decisions, it's not there to be rational, it's there for survival, it's there for fight or flight, it's there for when bears and tigers and sabers and tigers, whatever, uh, attacked you. Uh, and, and the frustrating thing is, hey, all the joke keeps me in a job, mind you, is that the brain hasn't moved on from that. There is no intellect in that area. So this is why as intellectual animals that we are, we sit and go, well, I mean, okay, there's a pandemic, but I shouldn't be feeling like this. I've still got work <laughs> to do. You know, all right, there's things going on, and I get it, and I'm and I, I'm I'm social distancing, I'm doing what I'm doing, but why am I sitting about watching te TV when I should be getting on with the work? You know, we've got all these sort of things because that primitive part of the brain is taken over, and um, it's in overdrive, and um, and it's putting us into either one of three states or three of them sometimes: anxiety, depression, or anger. In other okay. words heightened state of alert, um, reduce uh, or reduction completely nothing at all. It doesn't have to be anxiety, depression or anger. That's kind of labels we've been given as, uh, and, and so we can medicate people and, and other things. But um, it's, the anxiety is heightened alert, um, <clears throat> panic attacks, stress, not thinking clearly. Depression, of course, feeling low, lack of motivation, procrastinating. Um, low self-worth etc and anger of course is that frustration and annoyance of, of whatever's going on so that's a kind of generalized kind of way and, and, and why um, what we live with on a normal day um, we can sometimes fluctuate up and down within there when our stress bucket fills up and down depending on what's happening in life events but when we have a major life event that's happening to well, affect virtually everybody in the world certainly everybody where the, the, yeah, within the world, it makes a bigger difference. It puts another bit in your bucket that we're not used to, if you like. Yes, and I suppose, uh, yeah, it's you know because there's certain things you can control within your life, and this really does feel like it's out of control. And I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, I know as a small business owner how difficult it is, um, because you're so uncertain of the future. So I can imagine you at the moment are dealing with some big businesses as well, and you must be seeing the, the effects of this as well, not just in the personal lives of people within that business, but it really must be playing out in the way that they're making decisions and then that impacting their staff line. I mean, there's so many big, big businesses battling at the moment, you know, yeah. and that's another area that their staff don't feel like they can control. So yeah, it's, no, it's, a, it's, it's a really big, interesting. 
it's a big, big problem, of course. And actually, you're exactly right. Um, businesses are, are, are in that space where I think statistically at the beginning, on average, businesses had 27 days worth of cash, uh, which is not a lot. Um, and of course, we're now in today when, when uh, the Prime Minister said lockdown at the end of March. So we're now, you know, I don't know roughly, but we're, we're over 27 days, we're probably about 35 <laughs> days or whatever it is now. So on average, businesses are, are now in, in that kind of place and there's furlough and there's other things. And so absolutely. And, and of course, as you say, we, we want to do it. We know what we need to do, but something's stopping us, which is even more frustrating because we know we need to do something. And it's the generalised, which we'll, again, we'll, we'll come to, as you know, but it's a, of what to do about it. But it's a generalised statement of this bucket filling up, of us yeah. moving down into that primitive part of the brain, of that fight, flight, of that dread, and all these feelings, so it stops us being productive. And absolutely, I'm seeing it from the biggest businesses to the, all the way down to the individual. Lovely. And you know, I, th I like that image, and that's a good image for me to use. When I start feeling stressed, I'm actually going to, I'm going to picture that bucket in my head um, and, you know, picture it filling up because I'm good with image like that. It, it does help if I can create an image. So, oh, that's good. Um, David, before we jumped on the call, you spoke about something called the Kubler-Ross grief cycle. And you, be, you think it's something that could be quite useful for us. Now, I don't really know much about it, so I'd be really interested in you filling us in on what the Kubler-Ross grief cycle is, please. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. Yeah. Yes, so anyone who's interested uh, in or remembers the A-level psychology perhaps went through this. The Kubler uh, Ross grief cycle, sorry, is actually primarily uh, there specifically for grief. It's for terminally ill people, it's for death. And uh, it's a cycle, and it's perhaps something you could maybe share if you're sharing this on, uh, on, on social media, uh, the image oh. of it. But it's a cycle of, of grief that people go through when they realize that something large is happening in their life. Now, of course, um, it's specifically for um, people, an individual who's been told they're terminally ill or something like that, or something that you've lost a loved one, that type of thing. But the process actually works really, really well. And, and, and us understanding what's happening and gives more information, understanding what we're feeling at the moment. Mm -hmm. And also importantly, gives us an understanding of what potentially and from a modeling point of view what this what things are going to look like in the coming days weeks and months because if we follow the cycle because we're inverted commas going through grief and some of course people are literally going through grief then we know what we're having to expect as things go on uh, as well okay uh, as i say and in terms of the cycle um there's denial there's anger and then there's depression to begin with and of course we can pretty much see that and there's still people denying it actually isn't there uh, in different countries but yeah that's a different story but in terms of the denial that this isn't really affecting us no you know it's only for some people it's only the flu it doesn't matter you know or it doesn't affect young people it's only old people so that's okay you know all these kind of ridiculous statements that people have been making in the early some people have been making in the early days and then the realization of it and the anger and frustration and the loss of work the loss of jobs the loss of loss of life um, loss of society, community, um, ability to talk to people <laughs> and be with yeah. people face to face and the depression and how that overwhelms people. But then we start, to, when we start to move out of that cycle, which of course is what people are doing now and things, there is, as government says, and we need to be very, very careful of this, uh, and I completely agree with them that, you know, yes, we're moving out of this cycle, but we're not there yet and we still must have social distancing, we still must have, et cetera, all these different points, and of course we must follow that, absolutely. But we can see there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel and people thankfully can see, well, you know, eventually we're going to be getting out of this. And there's a lot of unknowns. Um, uh, I work with a couple of other guys in business, been in business a lot longer than I have, 30, 40 years. Um, and there is, they're big business leaders and they, again, like with some, we just don't know. And there yeah. are some things that we know and there's some things that we don't know. But from a personal point of view, from an emotional point of view, we know according to the Kubler-Gross uh, Ross grief cycle, uh, and in terms of how this works, we know that people are going to need emotional support. The government have pledged quite a bit of money so far um, to uh, mind the charity, uh, and I hope that they pledge more and that people and businesses realise this. Um, in terms yeah. of the emotional support, uh, that's 
supporting financially, supporting in lots of ways, but of course, as you know, what I'm interested in, and in support uh, from specifically about around your mental health and the emotional well-being of people. And yeah. as things move on as well, actually what people are needing is guidance and direction. Because yeah. it's when the leaders need to stand up in their fields. It's when, and I, and I believe, nothing to do with politics, but I believe that the, the, the leaders of, of our country um, are actually doing quite a good job. And, and I think that they are leading and they're giving good guidance and they're giving good direction. And it also means people like myself and people who else are, are leading in their uh, fields that we must give the, the good by one of the reasons why we're having this conversation, of course, we must give good guidance, good direction to businesses, to people, and of course, it's people that run businesses, and um, to make sure that they understand where they are, understand, you know, for example, the fear response, understand why they're not doing what they should be doing, uh, and and on how to make changes and, and how to make sure that they that they get through this as unscathed as possible. Yeah, that's a very interesting question for me. I wonder how many companies, I know because, I mean, I've been reading a lot of articles about, you know, redesigning your office uh, so that you work in a different environment. And uh, I'm very interested in the impact of this from a, you know, secondary wave and then the third wave. You know, all those things impact on our future, I suppose. And I'm always thinking ahead. But I'm wondering how many businesses are really thinking about the mental well-being of their people and spending some giving a budget to everybody, just even a little budget to say, go and speak to somebody or, you know, if you really struggle or have an internal person that they can talk to. Are there businesses actually investing in that, David? I, I mean, I don't know because I'm not in big business. So um, I'm just trying to think, I don't know about my clients if any of them are doing it. So I'd be very interested. Sorry, let me say some businesses are, absolutely. Um, some businesses that I work, I have a, a contracts with uh, multinational insurers and, um, and the, the to work with their clients, basically. And businesses that are forward-looking, and there's a yeah. saying in the Marines, adapt and overcome. Um, and it's what Woolworths didn't do, it's what Toys R Us didn't do. I'm no business expert in that sense, but by the and, looks of it, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's adapting and overcoming. So it's businesses saying, right, well, what can we do? What can we do to make, um, make the changes? How can we change within uh, society uh, to make sure that we were still, we're still profitable? Um, Oops, sorry, you paused there. Um, so oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, that aspect of and our businesses, I mean, absolutely. But as I always say, it's people that run businesses. Um, yeah, without yeah. people, it's just a brick and mortar ed edifice, edifice. Sorry, it's nothing. So uh, it's, it's vitally important that business leaders invest in, in their staff um, at this time more than ever. And it's, it's directly linked. Happiness, uh, it's not something that's just, you know, oh, it's nice to be happy. Happiness, etc., is directly linked to what we'll talk about actually um, later on. But happiness is directly linked to productivity because yeah, it, yeah. happiness chemicals are serotonin, endorphin, dopamine, and, and kephalin, noradrenaline, etc. So they're the chemicals that, that motivate people. So you need to create more of them to motivate you. And that's what as we were talking about earlier on there, when you're sitting going, I've got loads to do, but I can't do any of it for some reason. That's because you're not pr producing any of those chemicals because you're not being, because you're fear and overwhelm and everything else is coming on top of you. So yeah, absolutely. Clever businesses are investing in, 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 Mental in health. their staff and yeah. investing in their business to get out of this. And, and there's many elements of that, of course, um, yeah. within business, but one of them is investing in the individuals that are needing to take it forward. Fantastic. And so, David, I will make sure that your details are below as well, so that if anybody wanted to talk to you, I'm sure they could drop you a line and uh, question how you work and you yeah, know, yeah, anything like that. So I'll definitely put that below. Um, but David's going to join us for a couple more sessions as well. So if you've got questions, make sure that you let us know what those questions are and we can see if we can answer those as well. We'd really be interested to know, you know what your struggles are. So, David, um, the other thing, um, uh, how, do, how do we then... Um, do something? That's probably the big question. How do we move from this awful state of being fearful and anxious? Um, how can you give us something today that we could possibly take away with us and start to recognize those anxieties in ourselves and give us maybe some tips and tools that we can yeah. start to make changes? Yeah. I mean, if we sit 
in our house, although we have to stay in most of the time, <laughs> sit there rocking on the chair, trying to outthink our problems. We're not going to win because our brain okay. is very, very, very powerful. And the habitual aspect of our brain, which is the bit that's habitually doing whatever it is, but at the moment for some people, it's habitually being negative, um, then we're never going to outrun our brain. We've got 40,000 actions every second subconsciously, and we have one or two consciously. So we're just not going to outrun ourselves in that sense. So we can't outthink ourselves at the problem. Now, saying okay. that, it's very, very important to still be thinking positively. But what we need to do is take our mind off of something. And I used to, when I was as a therapist as well, and working with individuals, business leaders, all sorts, I used to kind of do this physically and used to kind of turn away and sort of say, you need to turn away from the problem just for a little bit. I know you need to deal with it, but you need to let that kind of die off. If we think about in your brain that the problems are weeds in your mind and you're the big strong oak tree. So the problems yeah. are, are weeds and we need to allow them to wither and die. And, and if we think of that analogy in terms of real life, uh, the, the weeds, etc., outside, how do they get energy? Well, the sunshine, the rain, etc., and they grow stronger and stronger. And imagine you're the big strong oak tree in the center. The stronger they grow, the more they'll stop you from flourishing. Um, it's exactly the same in the brain. Those okay. weeds that are growing, growing up in front of us, behind us, problems in front of us, behind us, behind us, we are the big strong oak tree. We are trying to flourish. If we give energy in terms of our brain, we mean thought energy. If we give energy to our problems, those weeds, then they will grow stronger and it will stop you from flourishing. It will stop you getting the nutrients that you need in the sunlight. And, you know, if you want to carry that analogy on. It's it almost strangles you. Yeah, no, I can exactly. see that. Yeah. Weeds can strangle trees. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So how do we stop weeds outside in the ground? We stop giving them energy and they wither and die. So we st they stop sunlight, whatever, etc. Okay. Exactly. That sounds wonderful, but now how does that happen? Yes, exactly. <laughs> because that's exactly a great the same picture. In the brain. Exactly the same okay. in the brain. We need to stop giving them energy. And by energy, I mean thought energy. Okay. Thoughts create feelings, feelings create actions, actions produce a result. So everything yeah. starts with our thoughts. Um, so whatever we're thinking about will grow into a feeling, will, will, will grow into an action and will become a result. If we're thinking bad thoughts, then we don't feel very good and we do nothing. So we don't do anything. So we don't get good results. And that's the basis of it. So we need to, st we need to stop giving energy to our weeds and our brain. We need to stop giving energy to our thoughts and those thoughts. And they will, for want of a better term, will wither and die off. So that's, sorry, a point. I was going to say, how do you stop? How do you stop giving them energy? I'm very interested in that, yeah. There's, there's aspects that you must just, you've got to take your mind off things. I say, we're only allowed an hour a day, etc. But you must, you must, when your brain start, when you start to go down that, path, that rabbit warren of worry, Sorry, um, David. We we did we did um, we lost you there for a second. I apologise. My internet connection sometimes right. plays up. So you take your mind off. You were saying you take yeah, your mind off. So you you literally off. go do something else. Yes, you've got to go and do something else. And imagine okay. you've got to catch yourself so that if your thoughts before your thought your worry goes down a rabbit warren of worry and goes away and gets lost, catch it as quickly as possible. Give yourself a break, don't allow it, and then move off and do something else. Go up, make a okay. cup of tea, go for a walk, take the dog out, do something, go into a different room, go and have a conversation, etc. Take your mind off it as quickly as possible. Because the habitual behavior at the moment is worry, whatever that is. Okay. So you need to yeah. change that habitual behavior, and you do that by doing something different more often, and the habit will then change. First and foremost, I say you've got to, before it goes down the wire at Warren, then you're away and you're half an hour, and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to lose my house, and all these sort of things that go in mm -hmm. your mind. It may well potentially be true, but you've, of course, got to stop that because we need to focus on what we do want to do. So very much put our foot down, very strongly, metaphorically speaking, put your foot down on yourself and don't allow yourself to go there. Okay. And then turn around and start to think positively. Think about what you do want. And no, it's a bit like, oh, positive thinking, not negative. You know, it's one of those kind of, it feels a bit ethereal, a bit out there, but it's tremendously important because our thoughts create our feelings and they will create the actions that we take or don't take and will give us the results that we want or, or that we're not wanting. So it's absolutely everything. But we've also got this thing within us that we've had for at least 200,000 years in this form and probably a lot longer in different forms. And it's an evolutionary responses that we've been working forever. And it's our uh, 
magical chemicals that we produce. I've already mentioned the magical happy chemicals that we all produce and we can produce more of them. And the main one I'm interested in is serotonin. Yeah. Um, and there's this the way that I talk about that is basically the three P's. Positive thinking, physical activity and positive interaction. So positive thinking we've already talked about. So if we do want more of those three actions, uh, uh, then we will we will change, we will incrementally become a better version of ourselves and feel better and become more productive. So why is that? Well, early man, early women were given certain evolutionary rewards, men and women working together, producing babies that make you feel good, and looking after your family, looking after your, what was worked better as tribes than individuals, you would all survive better, and um, success in supporting yourself, your families, all these different things, the things that make eating is in pleasurable activity, all these things that are pleasurable um, give us a feeling of well-being of serotonin. And, and, and of course, back 100,000 years ago, they had no idea what these rewards were, but they felt good, so they kept on doing them. We've now got neuroscience and we're well aware of what these different things are. So we don't need to run around throwing spears at animals anymore, thankfully, but we still need to do the same things in principle as we did yeah. in those days. And that is thinking about what we do want not what we don't want. Uh, physical activity, why Mr. Boris Johnson said, make sure and go out and exercise an hour every day. Um, the importance of that is tremendous. And positive interaction, not always as easy. I mean, I've not seen anyone either. Um, so I think it's similar to yourself, you know, it's not always as easy, but you know, positively interacting with the people that you do see, and of course across uh, on Zoom, it certainly helps. Um, and, and, and with your family members, if you do have them in, in your family, and of course people who are working because they're, because they're there, because some people are still at that. But the positive interaction, that creates the serotonin. Does it work overnight? Sometimes. But it's about taking the time to make the changes. What we do in society is we want a quick fix. We want the pill that makes yeah, us yeah, feel yeah. That's um, that's what dopamine does. That's why people like eating cream buns, donuts. That's why alcohol <laughs> consumption's gone up so high uh, in the UK since the lockdown. Um, prescription drugs, other things, gambling, uh, online gambling, um, whatever individual's vice is, because I'm not feeling good and I want to feel better, so I'm going to go on online gambling and I'm going to bet 50 quid and win a little bit and I feel quite good and then I lose it all and I don't feel good. Yeah. Or I eat that Jaffa cakes because I love Jaffa cakes. I always use that example. I eat those Jaffa cakes, <laughs> and then I'm eating them. And I'm thinking, why am I still eating Jaffa cakes? I don't really I'm not need even them hungry. anymore. Why am I eating? <laughs> why am I eating this massive bag of crisps when I could have just had a few out of them? I'm just eating and eating and eating because I want to feel better. Um, but actually, it doesn't do anything. So uh, in the long run, it brings yeah. you up and brings you back down again. So that spike. So it's a serotonin production. So we need to kind of one of the, the key principles of change is repetition. We need to be in this for the long game. The long game doesn't need to be months. No, okay. and, we, and we can feel better within hours and moments and days, but it's about recognizing the steps and taking them and being, not being hard on yourself. And when you're negative thinking, which we all do, it's programmed in us, it's a survival thing. When we go down there, just give yourself a break, it's okay. And then just build yourself back up again and, and keep moving. That's, that's interesting. I, I love that idea of turning away as well, that physicality of that, you know, when you're having a negative thought to physically turn away from it, because it does actually give you, it feels, it feels like you can do that, you know what I mean? So I would definitely be using that. I think that's a really nice step to do. And then all those other things. And I've found as well, for me, I'm doing a lot of giving back at the moment, um, as in I'm doing a running a free course and I'm doing things, I'm trying to help people wherever I can, you know, I'm happy to jump on Zoom calls with people. And I think think that's really helped me so you know they've always said giving back helps so yeah I think sometimes if you stuck to actually say well what can I do uh, can I help somebody else <laughs> yeah, exactly. even though I'm in a bad way can I help somebody else uh, you know I completely agree um the deeper study that I do in some of the courses is, is around metaphysics um etc and as in the the laws of nature, the universe, etc., um, and whatever we give out, we get back. Every action is yeah. an equal and opposite reaction. It's 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 physics. It's it's well known, but it's absolutely true. And what you give out, you give back. So you give happiness and love and joy and 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 time and you know and effort to people, then you will get that back. There's absolutely no doubt. It's physics. Yeah. 
Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and I love that. It's physics. And I, I think there's a lot of people that worry about self-help or positive thinking. And I love the fact that you bring it down. It's just physics, you know, at the end of the day, it yeah. is a, it is something that's bi biological and physical. No, David, thank you. So I was just going to quickly add there, no, in terms of that point, to bolster that point, because people often talk about the law of attraction, it's this or that or whatever, but they're happy with the law of gravity. You know, everybody's <laughs> absolutely happy with that one, you know, but nobody <laughs> argues about that. And, uh, and Well, maybe there's a couple out there that do, you well, know. There's always yeah, well, yeah, there <laughs> is. But, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's a different conversation, but it's, yeah, it's, it's just recognising that, all that, and that... The, Everything's working out for us. You're doing well. Just give yourself a break. You're doing well. You're doing good. Um, you know, you're doing the best that you can and enjoy it and uh, meditate if you can as well as a daily thing that I do. One of the, the tips that I wanted to add yeah. in here. And meditation is very, very important and it's quite common and popular nowadays, but it's very, very important. It's a daily thing that I do. Um, but add that into the three Ps, if you like, uh, as well. And that turning around aspect, yeah, just to kind of push that a little bit more. Uh, yeah. very pleasant. And that's very much like getting up from the computer when you're doing something and making the cup of tea. It seems not a lot, but it does, it can change things. I love that. That That is my biggest takeaway from it. I'm going to definitely practice that. I think I probably do a lot of that naturally because I don't like negative thoughts to overtake my brain. Yeah. Uh, because I just don't like going down rabbit holes. So yeah, I always do work, but that's interesting for me. I'm really going to be aware of it and I'm going to use that turning away and going to do something else. So I think that's really a key takeaway. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm not going to keep you much longer because I suppose people get to a point, like everybody at the moment, they can't watch things for too long. Maybe Netflix, that's about the only thing. But <laughs> um, I really, really appreciate your time, David, and your expertise. And I, hopefully if anybody's got any questions at all for David, I'm going to put his contact details below and you can get hold of him through his website, DRM Group. And... Um, and I know he's got a couple of offers on, and we'll go into those later on in our series. We've got another two coming up. What are we talking about next week, David? So what we're talking about is the individual. We've obviously touched on that today, and it's all about you. It's always about us because it's about creating change within you, being a better version of yourself, and then you can be the best version of you for others. So it's actually the most selfless thing to do. And how individuals <laughs> actually... Um, it's where the, all the changes, yes, big corporations do this and big corporations do that, and it's absolutely fantastic, and, and, and they can make good changes, but it's all about the individual, and, and what we're talking more about is how that thoughts create feelings, feelings create your actions, and actions produce your results, so what that really means uh, as the individual and how to really transform your own life, not just about getting out the hole that some people are in or out the, the predicament that some people are in, but really how to create a, a really higher level of performance in, in your own personal life as well. That'll be fantastic. And I'm sure that's something that all of us will benefit from um, right now and also going into the future. It's, it, you know, this will pass and, uh, and we will need to, to have better skills uh, self-help skills when we go back to the workplace it's going to be a different place for a little while so I, i'm really looking forward to that thank you so much and again thanks for your time david and uh, really lovely as always to talk to you pleasure and thank you. Bye.